Hello, I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Sunday. And uh, if you guys have any questions, it's a nice small group, and I'll, I'll be willing to answer anything that comes up as we go along. So, um, so I just wanted to talk about some common causes of shoulder pain. Okay. All right, so <coughs> there's uh, four, four groups or diagnoses that, that I'd like to talk about. And uh, they comprise probably 80 to 90 percent of the shoulder pain that we see in the office. Um, so we're going to talk about impingement syndrome, and that is the rotator cuff tendonitis or bursitis that you know most you know, we all hear so much about, and many of our friends, relatives, talk about that. And then rotator cuff tears, uh, and then the chromioclavicular arthritis, which is uh, joint on top of the shoulder here, commonly gives you pain in that area. And then glenohumeral arthritis, and basically that means shoulder arthritis. Um, which is wear and tear of the ball and socket joint. So, just so we get a little understanding of what we're talking about tonight, just go over a little anatomy of the shoulder. So, <coughs> the, sh the shoulder is a ball and socket joint. It's the proximal humerus, and the socket's called the glenoid. And the glenoid is a part of the shoulder blade. Um, some other things that we were talking about before is the, uh, the acromion is a projection of the shoulder blade that comes over top of the shoulder, and that's the one we talk about with the bone spurs. And the uh, clavicle meets up with the chromium to, to form that uh, chromioclavicular joint. Um, so those are the, the main uh, bony anatomy of the shoulder that we'd be going over tonight a little bit. So we often hear about the rotator cuff, but um, I don't know how many people really know what the rotator cuff is. <coughs> so really, it's a group of four muscles that surround the shoulder. And we talk about problems with the rotator cuff, we primarily talk about tendon issues. But the four muscles are the supraspinatus, which is above the scapular spine. So this is a shoulder blade that's a scapular spine. So supraspinatus refers to above the scapular spine. Infraspinatus is below the scapular spine. And then there's another muscle, the teres minor. The fourth muscle is actually in front of the shoulder, and that's the subscapularis, and that comes across the front. But you can see how they envelop the ball. So they actually go around the whole ball. Uh, but that's, that's uh, really what the rotator cuff is. So the impingement syndrome is probably the most common uh, cause of shoulder pain that we see. And that's the tendonitis and bursitis that we talk about so often. So <coughs> it's rotator cuff tendonitis, which is that a tendon attachment to the bone. Uh, often involves a biceps tendonitis. So the biceps comes up and goes into the shoulder joint, attaches the top of the socket. And then subacromial bursitis. So when we talk about bursitis, we're generally talking about subacromial bursitis, which means below the acromion. So this bluish thing here, um, indicates that bursa. And what a bursa is, basically a fluid-filled sac that allows uh, joints or um, tendons to glide or skin to glide over, like over our elbow. So the rotator cuff tendon is between uh, the ball and that acromion. And that's where the bursa lies. We get inflammation of the bursitis, <coughs> of the bursa, that's bursitis. Inflammation of tendons, tendonitis. So any itis is really kind of like an inflammation. So to make uh, a diagnosis, when someone comes into the office, we take a history, go over their symptoms, we do a physical exam, and then we often uh, take a look at some imaging studies. So an x-ray is something that's easy for us to guess right here in the office, and we'll often obtain an MRI, which allows us to see the muscles, the tendons, the bursa, and other things that we just don't see on the x-ray. So the main symptoms we see with this tendonitis and bursitis or impingement syndrome is pain in the upper part of the arm. And usually a rotator cuff <laughs> tendonitis is going to be out in this area, and a biceps tendonitis will be more in the front of the arm or anterior. And <clears throat> impingement symptoms tend to be worse with any overhead activity, so anything above your shoulder. And a lot of times you also see some limited range of motion. And most frequently, it involves reaching behind the back. So most people that have that are going to have little trouble instead of being able to go all the way up, you know, maybe get back here. So <coughs> um, 
When we take x-rays in the office, uh, this is called the, an, an outlet view, which lets us see the outlet where the rotator cuff tendons come in here between that acromion. So that's actually that projection of the shoulder blade, the acromion. And that's the bone spur that many people often talk about. Um, so <clears throat> we talk about different types of acromion. There's a flat acromion or a type 1, a curved acromion like this one, type 2, or sometimes it can be more hooked. We call that a type 3 acromion. So the more curved and hooked acromions have a higher incidence of um, impingement symptoms. One of my mentors would say it's like being between a rock and a hard place for that rotator cuff tendon because it's between this bone and this bone. So that whole idea of impingement with that bone spur is that there's some wear um, from rubbing between the bones. Um, <coughs> recently there's been more interest too in the fact that the tendon doesn't have a very good blood supply so it often sees some attritional wear and we'll talk about that as we go along a little bit more. So this is uh, an MRI image which shows a typical uh, MRI with someone with some rotator cuff tendonitis or that impingement syndrome. So what we see here is it's a picture looking from the front and this is actually the glenoid or the socket. This is the proximal humerus or the ball there. This is uh, part of the supraspinatus muscle and then this is actually the tendon and as it attaches to the bone out here we see a little increased fluid signal or inflammation in the tendon. We also see a little more fluid up top here which would be consistent with some bursitis. And that's that acromion that sits on top so you can see how the uh, tendon lies between the, uh, the ball and the acromion tendon and then that fluid filled sac that allows it to glide between there the bursa. Right, so <clears throat> most of the time treatment for impingement syndrome is going to be non-surgical. And with most of these issues we talk about activity modification. So that's a fancy way of saying, you know, when someone says, doctor, it hurts when I do that, and the doctor says, well, don't do that. So that's, that's activity <laughs> modification. So we don't want to do things that irritate it or keep it inflamed. And then uh, probably our next line of treatment is physical therapy. Um, and what that primarily involves is strengthening the rotator cuff muscles and the scapular stabilizer. So, uh, the rotator cuff surrounds, that ball, uh, surrounds the whole ball and helps keep it centered in the socket. So we want those muscles to work as well as they can to keep the, keep the shoulder in the proper position. The muscles that attach to the shoulder blade help position the shoulder blade. So we want those muscles working well too. When we have pain in the shoulder, we don't use it. It's like a vicious cycle. We just stop using it, muscles work worse, things tend to go downhill. So we try to intervene and try to get things working better. We also work on some stretching because we lose this motion to reach behind us. We get some tight tightness of the capsule and that affects the way the shoulder works too. It causes more of the impingement problems. So we try to correct that as well. And another real simple thing to try is a cortisone injection. And the way I think about cortisone injections, it's, it's, it's a corticosteroid injection. And it basically just decreases inflammation, to keep it simple. I'm, it's, it's basically just to take down the inflammation in the area. And some people do real well with that. And then, um, so we we'll usually try a non-operative course if it's just we think it's just an impingement syndrome or a tendonitis or bursitis problem. And if it doesn't improve, we consider surgical intervention if the patient's not satisfied with how they're dealing. So most of the time we're going to do an arthroscopic subacromial decompression. And um, uh, so arthroscopic means that we're just making small incisions, we're using the camera, usually using a motorized shave or motorized burr. And we remove that bone spur. So basically we take that acromion from a curved uh, structure with the bone spur on the front and make it more flat. And we also remove the inflammatory bursal tissue. And so post-operatively generally it's just a sling for comfort, <coughs> you know, no restriction of motion. You may, oftentimes you don't want to move it very much but we like it to because we don't want the shoulder to get stiff. <coughs> and we'll do some physical therapy for progressive uh, <laughs> range of motion and strengthening. 
And so realistically, the recovery is two to three months. It doesn't mean you can't do anything, but hopefully after two to three months, you're feeling pretty good and you're back to most of your normal activities without any restriction. Is that surgery done in office or outpatient? Uh, you, it's, it's outpatient, yeah. Now when you do a total replacement shoulder, mm -hmm. do you do arthroscopic? No, no, it's not an arthroscopic procedure. But we'll get to that yeah. a little bit. We'll go over that a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. So the next thing we like to talk about are rotator cuff tears. And that's a real popular topic as well, something that we hear a lot about. And really, it's a, it's a tendon problem. The muscles, they're generally OK. But the tendon attachment to the bone is where the issues occur. So you can see in this picture that you know any muscle tissue is very red. It's got a great blood supply. If you cut into a muscle, it bleeds a lot. The tendons, they're those white structures that attach to the bone. So their blood supply, not so good. And when we talk about a rotator cuff tear, it's when we don't just have inflammation there, but there's actually a defect in the tendon. So basically like a hole in the tendon where it's supposed to be attached to the bone. So in terms of symptoms, um, you know, most people that have rotator cuff tears, it's not because they fell or something happened, but it's just a gradual onset. And um, they're uncommon under age 40, but very common over age 70. So if we take everybody over age 70 and run them through an MRI machine, probably 30% of people have some, some rotator cuff tear. And the one reason that we think these tears occur is because of the poor blood supply. So just like any other tissue in the body, the tendons uh, have some attritional wear and they have to repair that. And if they don't do a good job of repairing it, they, they develop attritional problems over time. So just like if you scrape your skin or your skin sloughs off and it's always replacing itself, your bones are always um, remodeling and you know repairing themselves. The tendons have the same issues. So I, I like to think of tendonitis and tears as, as a spectrum of a disease where sometimes you start with some inflammation, sometimes the tendon becomes degenerate over time, and if it can't fix itself, a lot of times it develops a tear and it just happens gradually. And with age, very common. Okay. So Although they most commonly gradually occur, they can occur or worsen after a trauma such as a fall or, or a car accident. It's uh, often common ways that we see increases in pain or acute tendon ruptures. <clears throat> and the symptoms of rotator cuff tears generally pains out in this area. So you know a lot of people come in and say oh, I have a shoulder problem that hurts up here. Well that doesn't make me think of shoulder issues. Somebody comes in here and says, you know, my arm hurts. That makes me think of shoulder problems, especially rotator cuff problems. So we still have, you know, because it's similar to the tendonitis, we have similar symptoms. Difficulty with overhead activities, some limited range of motion, and also weakness. Um, but a lot of times it's difficult to, you know, tell is it tendonitis, is it a tear? It's difficult to distinguish just based on our exam because a lot of muscles compensate, especially when we think about that rotator cuff encompassing the whole shoulder. If there's a small tear, the guys around are going to do the work that that part that's torn isn't doing. Um, but with bigger tears, uh, then we definitely see some weakness. And specifically, this external rotation motion, once we have weakness with that, it usually means there's a bigger tear because that usually involves the infraspinatus tendon because that's the primary muscle that performs that function. Um, and if you get into huge problems where the rotator cuff's completely shot, sometimes you get a, what we call a pseudoparalysis. So people, when they try to lift their arm up like this and instead of just raising it up, they got to do this kind of thing. Because um, when, when the shoulder becomes unbalanced and that rotator cuff doesn't keep the ball centered in the socket, it's difficult to initiate the motion even though some of the other muscles still work. The delt, you know, we have that big deltoid muscle that often compensates for, um, for some of the rotator cuff weakness, but when it's completely out of whack, then we get this kind of thing. 
So basically they can be small or large, they can be retracted or non-retracted, and then <coughs> with long-standing problems we see muscle atrophy. Um, so just next slide. What so does that retracted or not retracted mean? Well, we'll try to demonstrate that here. So <coughs> we got in some MRI pictures and I'll try to explain it. And if you're confused by anything, just ask. Um, so this shows basically a small tear. So again, this is the ball, this is the socket, our muscle tissues back here, and this is our tendon. Now it's supposed to attach over here. This white stuff on these pictures is a fluid signal. So we're not supposed to see any disruption in that tendon. It's supposed to come all the way over. Now that's only retracted maybe a centimeter, you know, it's blown up here, but it would translate to about a centimeter of retraction. So that one's a you know, small tear not to retract it. Now we <coughs> next one. Now this is a, a, a really big tear and it's way retracted. The tendon's all the way over at the level of the socket. It's supposed to be going all the way over here. So that's a big, big retracted tear. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of rotator cuff tears are, are not symptomatic. When we say 30% of people over age 70 probably have some rotator cuff tear. We're, you know, we don't see 30% of people over age 70, so a lot of rotator cuff tears aren't that symptomatic. And um, we do do some non-surgical treatment for rotator cuff tears. And that often involves physical therapy um, where we try to strengthen the surrounding muscles, try to compensate for the muscles that don't work well. And the cortisone injections are often helpful, help reduce inflammation and pain that's associated with the tears. So the non-surgical treatment, a lot of times we're talking about for older and lower demand patients, uh, patients and you know, old's a relative term. Um, you know, some older people are still very active and fit and they, you know, and some younger people aren't so much. So it depends a little bit on your activity level. And small or tears, that eh, looks like a tear, but not really sure on the MRI. And then partial tears, we'll usually try some non-surgical treatment first as well. When we talk about surgical treatment. Uh, <coughs> um, there's been a big move towards arthroscopic surgery for rotator cuff tears. And almost all the rotator cuff tears that I'm repairing, a lot of guys I work with are repairing, we do them arthroscopically. But there's certainly indications or reasons or some guys that feel like they can do a better job open and that's, that's fine. The main advantage is um, with an arthroscopic repair, you're just making small incisions. With the uh, open repair, you have to violate that deltoid muscle a little bit and there's some, some morbidity or um, sometimes it doesn't heal as well as you'd like to when you have to do that. So I think that's the main advantage of doing them arthroscopically. Plus it's just a different way of looking at things. Some things you feel like you can see better with the camera, manipulate things better. So it's just a little bit of surgeon preference. And basically what we try to do is repair the tendon back to the bone. So we often hear something like, my friend had a rotator cuff repair and then the rest usually isn't so good. So, <coughs> I mean, the, the reason why it's a difficult problem is, oh, I think, because of the, the poor blood supply that the tendon has. So it doesn't heal readily. And the tendon healing really may take up to 12 weeks. And uh, so it makes for a slow recovery. And if they look at them critically, <coughs> probably 30% of the repairs we do don't heal the way we'd like them to. However, eight or nine out of 10 of the people that have the surgery are satisfied with the results. So postoperatively, because the tendon um, is, is just a poor healer and it takes a long time, Usually we're going to do passive motion only, and that means you're not lifting it on your own, you know, but we do like to move it because we don't want the shoulder to get stiff. Um, so first six to eight weeks, mostly passive motion. Some bigger tears, we might even go a little slower. And then we do progressive strengthening and, and try to get our motion back, reestablish a full motion of the shoulder. Um, and really, the recovery is slow and uh, four to six months can improve for a year. And a lot of people, three months doing pretty good, but four to six months hopefully doing pretty good. Back to most of our activities and feeling better. So the next thing we'd like to go over is the uh, chromioclavicular arthritis. So, and the AC joint <coughs> is the joint between the uh, 
the acromion, which is that projection from the shoulder blade, and that's that guy right there, and the end of the collarbone. And this is an arthritic joint, very narrow bone spur. Um, <coughs> and um, it's, it's real common. And again, it's one of these things that's not always bothersome. Um, so it can, you can have uh, isolated AC arthritis, or a lot of times we see it with rotator cuff tendonitis, rotator cuff tears. But this usually causes pain right on top of the shoulder, not so much out here. So when someone comes in and hurts up here, that's what we're thinking about. And when you push on that joint, it's sore. So it's tender, or when you push on it, it hurts right on, the, right on the end of the collarbone. As far as treatment for that, a lot of times I like to try a cortisone injection to see if that takes away the pain. The physical therapy, which can be real helpful with the tendonitis and cuff tears, not so helpful with AC arthritis. And surgery to correct it, relatively simple. You remove part of the end of the collarbone. And you can do that through a small incision right on top or again, uh, arthroscopically. My preference a lot of times if it's an isolated, just AC problem, do, small, do just do a small incision. If we're dealing with rotator cuff tears or other problems, usually do it arthroscopically. And uh, no restriction on motion after surgery, just a sling for comfort. Let you rest a few weeks so it feels a little bit better, then work on some strengthening. And two to three months, hopefully back to pretty much normal activity. So the last thing I want to go over briefly is uh, glenohumeral or shoulder arthritis. So that's arthritis of the ball and socket joint. And um, the shoulder is really pretty tolerant <coughs> of arthritis. Um, but when it starts looking like this, it's, that's kind of the end of the line. So the ball is all misshapen. It's got this giant bone spur. Um, the, this, the socket, the bone's a little sclerotic, we'd say, or it's thicker and it's seen a lot of stress. Um, next slide. So the symptoms we see with that are just generalized pain in the shoulder. And when it becomes more advanced, we often get some grinding. If your shoulder grinds, there's a good chance you have pretty significant arthritis there. And <clears throat> almost always, the range of motion becomes very limited with, um, with significant shoulder arthritis. The, the capsule around the shoulder gets thickened. And then also the bony issues with it limit the range of motion. So many times, people with severe shoulder arthritis, you know, where you can normally move your arm out like this, maybe like this. And uh, night pain is a common thing with all shoulder problems, but especially shoulder arthritis. So there are some non-surgical options. Uh, we do inject a uh, shoulder joint with um, cortisone as well, a little different than the way we inject for uh, tendonitis. Um, a lot of times that does make it feel better for a while. And uh, some of the stuff that we inject into the knee, like Synvisc or other lubricating injections, they're not approved for use in the shoulder uh, in the United States, but <coughs> sometimes we get samples and do that. If the arthritis isn't severe, I think it works pretty well. If it's severe, like that last picture we add up, mm, probably doesn't work very well. And you can try physical therapy as well, but again, it's, it's not as effective as it is with the rotator cuff issues. And the mainstay of treatment is uh, shoulder replacement. So that involves resurfacing the ball and socket. So on this picture, we see a, a stem, we say prosthesis or replacement, and that resurfaces the ball there. And you say, well, where's the socket? Um, the socket's usually only a plastic piece, so we don't really see it on the x-ray. There's this little marker in the center of the socket there. But that would be a total shoulder replacement. There's been more of a move towards total shoulder replacement where we resurface both the ball and the socket because it's better for pain relief. And people that do more heavy labor activities, um, you may more, give more consideration just doing the ball because the failures tend to occur more on the socket side. So shoulders that see a lot of stress still, 
you know guys are going to be beating it up, maybe only replace the ball. And post-operatively, the sling's mostly for comfort. Uh, we like to start moving the shoulder early. We usually start PT early for shoulder replacements um, and, and mostly passive range of motion. The one thing to, to do the shoulder replacement, um, you need to basically you need a window to get in the shoulder and that involves detaching that subscap tendon. Um, so we usually allow six weeks for healing of the subscap and then um, and then start some more active uh, motion and strengthening after six weeks. And <clears throat> with the shoulder replacements, you know, even the shoulder looked like the terrible looking one that we had up there earlier, a lot of times you get some early pain relief. You don't have that grinding every time you move it. it that's gone. You do have some post-surgical pain, but a lot of times the pain relief for, is, is good early. But recovery, regaining the motion that you had lost and getting that shoulder to work better and strengthen up some of the muscles can, again, take four to six months and improve for a year. I think that's, that's, uh, that's all I have for, for those issues. Um, if anybody has any questions, we'd be happy to try to answer any. Jackie, can you uh, moderate the questions? And <laughs> How about yeah? yeah. <coughs> when you oh, yeah. At night when you sleep, yeah. Would that tend like arthritis? Would that tend to make fingers tingle? And no. Sleep like that's something else. Something yeah. else. Yeah, I mean tingling at night is most it's commonly. Right. Yeah, I mean when someone comes in, they say they have tingling in their hands at night. I mean most of the time it's going to be carpal tunnel, and the, a lot of reason that is is when we sleep. We tend to flex our wrists down, kind of sleep like this, you know, you get comfy. And with our wrists in a flex position, it puts more stress on the nerve at the wrist. People wake up at night and you have uh, tingling. So, but it's, it's, it's uncommonly uh, related to shoulder problems. Yeah, so a simple thing to try is get a wrist splint if it's mostly at night. And that, that, that keeps your wrist up, keeps you out of a position where you get the numbness. How about you? I'd like to ask a question to the physical therapist. Is stretching a good thing to do every day for your shoulders and your neck and body? It can be. You've got to watch that, that you don't have a nerve issue going on because nerves, um, neural tissue don't tend to like to be stretched. Um, so I usually let pain be your guide. In general, stretching can be great. You just, if you get pain or you get pain that radiates down further away from your neck, it's not something you want to push into. Um, but generally we do, we want to keep the body mobile, we want to keep moving uh, for the spine in general, neck, low back, walking, uh, with, in general tends to move your whole body and it's a good exercise, but if you get pain every time you walk or every time you, you know, move your head or sleep, those are things, you know, maybe see the doctor and, and the doctor can help you and or you come to physical therapy even if it's a couple times and we do the activity modification and we show you what stretches are appropriate for you. Um, because I've also had people come in and they're doing all kinds of crazy yoga moves and that's not necessarily good for everybody. So um, a lot of what we do in physical therapy is, is put our hands on you manually and, and, and move you, but we also educate you quite a bit on what's okay and what's not okay for your diagnosis. Um, so sometimes that's helpful as well. So you can talk to your doctor about that or if you need help getting set up with Dr. Sunday or a doctor, we'd be happy to help you. Um, Many of our therapists also have direct access, so you are allowed to come to therapy um, without a prescription <laughs> from the doctor. However, if we think so for one visit, if we think something's really going on, we're going to refer you back to the doctor because we want you to get worked up and make sure everything else is going okay. Um, but uh, a, lo a lot of times we can see you for that first visit without that prescription from the doctor and then guide you in the right direction. So if you have more questions about that, I can tell you after. Was there a question up here? Yeah. Do you do many uh, shoulder replacements? Yeah. Really? Yeah, fair number, yeah. And when you operate, is it on your back or in the front? It's in the front. Oh, in the front. Yeah, an incision like from here to here. Does that take many hours? Uh, not many. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> probably about, about two hours, probably. Yeah, that's, that's plenty. Yeah. Um, another question. How soon could you drive after that's done? Um, driving's always a, 
an issue with shoulder problems because many times you really can't use the shoulder the way we need to to drive. But <coughs> people yeah. drive. Yeah, so we usually don't advise driving until you're able to use it fairly well and you're comfortable and confident using it. So after that, you know, probably two months or so, but... Um, Months. But yeah, but you know, it's 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 usually one arm. So most people are, you know, despite they're going to drive with one arm. Yeah, I'm doing that now. Yeah. Because <laughs> I can't turn the wheel with this. <laughs> yeah. Is frozen shoulder biceps tendonitis? Mm -mm. Now I I didn't mention frozen shoulder, but um, it's we call that adhesive capsulitis is the medical term for it, and it usually just occurs. Uh, and another, we'll use another fancy word, idiopathic, meaning it just happens. Okay, so that's, that's a fancy word for it just kind of happens. Um, so it, what, what happens with frozen shoulders typically is there's a capsule around the shoulder just like all our joints and it gets thickened and inflamed. So a lot of times it's painful to start and then our motion becomes restricted. And then a lot of times the pain settles down but it just doesn't move well. And that's when people come in and they have a normal x-ray, not an arthritic shoulder, because a lot of times an arthritic shoulder will be kind of frozen too. Um, <clears throat> but uh, with the normal looking x-ray and their shoulder just kind of especially with this external rotation movement, is, is not usually a painful move. You know, when we bring people's arms up like this, a lot of times it hurts. But this movement's usually not very painful, but they're just kind of stuck there. And uh, many times it's self-limiting, meaning that it kind of goes away on its own if you ignore it long enough, but a lot of times it takes like a year till it loosens up. Um, we usually do some therapy, sometimes we do some injections. Sometimes we manipulate the shoulder, meaning we put you to sleep and just kind of push on it and break up some of the scar tissue, or we do an arthroscopy where we release the capsule around the shoulder sometimes. But that's, that's kind of a quick frozen shoulder thing. One more question? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's on physical therapy, like they say that you, know, you should lift weights and things like that, but you should never use a lot of weight when you do physical therapy when you get older, is that correct? Um. I mean, it really depends on the person. If you had been lifting weights and you're doing okay for a long time, it might be okay. But in general, when we're doing it, doing rehab, we don't tend to do heavy weight. Um, it's, more repetitions than weight. It might be more repetitions than weight. It might not. If you have like a tendonitis or some sort of irritation, we don't want to do a million reps because we'll irritate the tendon or, or whatever's going on. Um, so it really depends on what the diagnosis is and what's going on. But in general, more weight's gonna put more stress on a joint or put more stress on the tendon attaching the muscle to the, to the bone. So lighter's usually better. Yeah. Would I be able to get dressed after shoulder replacement? Um, By myself, let's put Most that. likely. Oh, all right. Yeah. Is that for your uncle two weeks at you need a little. You need a little help at first. Um, from my experience, usually the first two weeks, two weeks are pretty Pretty tough. I have to go to state penitentiary for two weeks. No, no, but sometimes, yeah, or, or yes, yeah, sometimes they'll 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 put you so you let you go there for a little while just to have help if you have no help at home. The total shoulders do pretty well a lot of times because the pain's down, and they're, if they're not repairing the rotator cuff or anything, you're only restricted kind of in one motion, so to speak. So um, you're restricted to some extent, but after a couple of weeks, people do pretty well. Um, the rotator cuff is probably the hardest because you can't lift, you're not, we don't allow you to move your arm for a good six weeks sometimes. What if it's a total replacement and a rotator cuff? Would it be that? Uh, sort of. <laughs> Part of it, uh, yes. <laughs> so, usually um, if there's a significant rotator cuff tear with uh, arthritis, Many times we're doing a reverse shoulder replacement now, meaning that you put a ball on the socket and kind of a socket on the ball because the total, like a, a replacing the glenoid doesn't work without the rotator cuff because you don't have that centering force and you get abnormal mechanics and it just, you know, the, the socket fails. So there's a little different design that seems to work pretty well. It's kind of a salvage, it's kind of last ditch kind of thing, but it's, uh, it's done very commonly now.
live in a fast-paced, on-demand world where everything is available at a moment's notice. Now your health care can be on-demand as well. Coordinated Health, the name you trust for superior care, now offers care on-demand, where you can walk in, no appointment necessary, and receive immediate care for all non-life-threatening emergencies. With specialists in primary care, orthopedics, cardiology, and women's health, and locations throughout the Lehigh Valley and Poconos, quality care is never out of reach. Coordinated Health, your prescription for better health.